Well, hello, this is Diana Flegel here with my co-host, Eddie Jones from Reality Coaching for Writers. And Eddie, what is our tagline? Uh, let's see, nothing but reality. No, that's not it. Uh, <laughs> no fluff, no, no bunnies. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been so long since I've said it. No fluff, just the real stuff. There you go. No fluff, you just go. the real stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So what question, Eddie, are we going to be answering for our listeners today? What did he say, she asked? Today we're going to talk about dialogues. Dialogue okay, and great. Fiction, and fiction and nonfiction. Um, and, and it's just one of those simple things. It came to me because I don't think we've ever done a, a, an episode on dialogue. We've talked about a lot of different things, but uh, we've never really got into the to dialogue. It's some... Um, and it's, I mean, it's key to storytelling because most story, if it's a good story, it's made up of conversation. So, yeah. you know, dialogue is the heart of most stories. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that are just, when you think of dialogue, it's almost like throwaway um, structure of a story. It's almost thrown away because you're just hearing people speak. So I thought we'd kind of do it today. I had a question come came to me last week about, and I've seen this before, maybe you have, of, um, conversations are compressed into one paragraph among multiple characters and that's that's kind of what prompted this and i was like mm, uh, if you're looking to get to 10 pages on this it's going to be really easy because we're just going to format your dialogue correctly and you're suddenly you're at 10 pages you know um so tell me your experience when you were editing for heartline and, and when you're editing with clients about what you see on dialogue tags well there was either an overuse of them or a lack of them. And I think striking that balance is so important. But like you said, Eddie, the formatting of, a, of multiple conversations really helps your reader out because they can, they can follow so much better, um, you know, the storyline and what, what's happening. So, and dialogue is a great way to show and not tell. So mastering it is really important. Good storytellers know uh, how to write great dialogue. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I, I cheat on this when I, with, uh, well, actually I cheat, cheated recently with one of my clients on this, because again, the same thing, he, he encapsulated a, a summary of a, an event or a scene, right? In prose, which is telling, right? He told it. And I just put it in chat GPT and said, break this out into a conversation between two or three characters. That's all I did. And it came back and listed, you know, character one, character two, character three, and just took the same information and put it in their voice, right? Which is dialogue. And now you're telling the story, you know, I mean, you're showing the story to the reader rather than the writer telling the story. Uh, and it just makes a world of difference. You know, the whole thing just, it's, you know, as we said this before, dialogue is action. For the right. reader, it's action. Things, people yeah. are acting because they have to speak, you know, so. Yeah, that's good. And that's a great way to show an example to the person you're coaching, you know, to be able to show them a, an example of the difference like that. Yeah. yeah so from my perspective, um, it's, a, it's it, it, for me, it's a little bit uh, tricky because I write middle grade and YA fiction. And um, there are these hard, fast rules for dialogue. That, I mean, dialogue is kind of like commas. Uh, you put two authors in a room together and they're, they're going to argue about dialogue. And, and how it works, right? They, generally speaking. Um, yeah, generally speaking. Yeah, but for, I'll just throw this out as a, as a comment for anyone who's writing middle grade and YA. Um, in some ways, you can't overuse dialogue tags because early readers need them as clues, oh. right? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> when you're writing for the adult market, hopefully your, your readers a little more mature and they understand, they can keep more thoughts in their head and track things better but when you're when you're dealing with younger readers um it's okay to, to go in and just keep retagging she said and then he said and then he said and then she said that it's all you almost want to err on the side of overuse right because if you just go normally the example i give is you can go about three times without referencing who the speaker is and then you want to tag one of them so we don't lose track but with younger readers you you probably don't want to go three six lines down you probably need to do it about almost every other time um so there's that and the other thing i'll sense. say the other thing i'll say about why readers and dialogue um 
is it's okay to use adverbs and adjectives. Typically we say avoid adverbs and adjectives, but if you do a, if you do a really good job of showing what's going on in the story and then also use an adverb or an adjective to add to that, what you're doing is you're training that reader to recognize when they see an ad, that adverb or ad, adjective to expect this something like this to be going on in the scene, right? So you're beginning to, it's almost like teaching a, a dog, right? You're teaching them a behavior. So right. when they say, uh, uh, she was frantically running about, right? If you said that, right? and then you followed that up with a scene uh, showing her knocking over a bucket, tripping, falling down, losing things, grabbing things, running into a door jam as she was running out, just a short little description. Now the reader understands what frantically looks like, right? Oh, that's good, so, yeah. So then when they get a little bit older and they see somebody running into door, door, door jams and all, they and their mind associate she's frantic, right? They associate that emotion. Um, yeah. So that's just, but those are, that works for middle grade and YA. And then after you get out of the YA market, uh, really after you get readers are up to 16, 17 years of age, they should be able to know this without using adverbs and adjectives. I say that because, uh, and I, maybe I've made this comment before, go read the first book that J.K. Rollins wrote about Harry Potter loaded with adjectives and adverbs and she did really well with that series so it, uh, it, it, <laughs> so keep that in mind okay yeah yes so let's talk a little bit about dialogue dialogue so what, what are your thoughts on, on tagging and how it all works out well like you um recently i read a, a cozy mystery and i got totally lost as to who was speaking and I generally only like a minimal amount of tags because I'm already in their head. I'm, I'm in the room with them. So I'm kind of, I don't need the he said, she said. But like you, if you don't interrupt and, and really clarify once in a while who is doing the speaking, it can get so muddled. And these characters weren't distinct enough that was one of the faults that i uh noticed they weren't distinct enough that i got lost i went back and i read it three times and after that i was just in like the third chapter i returned the book to the library because i didn't want to work that hard <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's don't so totally make me work hard to read your book so um, yeah, it, again, it's all about your reader. So you help them, but you don't overdo it. So it's a it's a balance. Yeah, that breaks sure. the Ron Benray rule of don't don't force your reader to get out of their fictional dream just so you, you can they can figure out who's talking. You, once you do that, you've lost them. So go, let's go back for a minute and talk talk what you hit on. Just they weren't distinct enough. And explain to the viewers what what you meant by that. Well, so. Um, each character's personality, in other words, they're it by the dialogue, I was not able to tell which person was talking because their personalities, they made them too similar. So like Eddie, it's very apparent when you and I are in a room and we're talking that we're different. Right. <laughs> because we just show our unique character traits and um you need to to show that in the development of your characters you have to really give them something uh that distinguishes them from the other person in the room and, and it might be a twitch you know or something it might be a draw or her speaking fast him speaking slow but there's something that helps you distinguish it could be age difference you know but it has to be apparent to the reader so that when you're not tagging it as far as who specifically is talking whether it's jane dick or jane talking um you have to be able to distinguish them yeah, that, and that's that is uh it, it it it's a rule. Well, I shouldn't say it's a rule. It's uh, definitely what you just said is definitely strongly encouraged. 
Uh, and yet it, it breaks, it can possibly break a, your writing style because if you've got two characters who are very similar, right? How are you gonna, how are you gonna distinguish between the two unless you overtly make one really different, right? Well, now maybe you didn't want them to be overly different, but in order to do accomplish this, you you had to do it. So, um, I, and I agree with you. You've got to you've got to do something unless you're just going to be heavy on tags. Um, you know, one of the things that we typically teach uh, on this is to make sure you have a character that always has two or three um, cliche sayings that they go with. And I, I say cliche meaning it's just going to be cliche to them, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, I use I'll, I may use uh, if there's a character a male character, for example, that's referencing somebody else. He may, he may use the word bub all the time. You know, don't, don't touch that bub, leave that alone. That's not for you, right? And then a little bit later it says, you know, the guys will, you know, can I help you? I don't know, bub, I mean, how old are you, 14? Isn't it kind of young for, for you to be doing that, right? So if this guy just uses the word bub all the time, uh, now we always know who's speaking, right? Between two right. males that's talking back and forth. Um, and so that's, that's just a little short trick. If you can just find one or two words, and Bob's just, you know, one, but you just find a word, one word mm -hmm. or one phrase that your character kind of just drops in occasionally. That's a good way to always let the reader know who the speaker yeah. is. Um, that's good. Yes. Yeah. You know, so for fun, I, I was working on something last week and, and I, I had the same issue. It's two, two guys talking and neither one of them or that have that distinctive of, uh, you know, a mannerisms. And I just didn't feel like dealing with it. So I took the dialogue for one and I said, just, just make this guy sound like a, a Val surfer dude from California, right? And he did. You know, Chat GTV turned it into a surfer dude. So it's the same, it's the same conversation. It's just now he's if everything's dude and bro and all this kind of, you know, all these other kind of words tossed in. And it was really easy for Chat GPT to fix it and me to drop it back in and go, okay, now, now I've got two different characters. And he's a throwaway character anyway. He's not going to show up in the series, I mean, in the book later. So just a throwaway character. Um, but you got to know these things. You know, you got to know, you got to yeah. know to drop them in. So where do well, we and I have a question for you, Eddie. How, how long, like, how do you percentage wise? Um, in a single chapter, we're, let's use your middle reader as an example. Um, what percentage of that chapter would you say is dialogue versus scene setting or, you know? Oh, I try to keep it 70% of it's going to be dialogue because I'm writing for that age group where if it's not dialogue, they're not going to read it. Um, they're, they're not going to read chunks of, of prose. Now, you know, I, I think I mentioned this, well, I know I mentioned this last week, you know, that, that I had these whole sections where it was nothing but prose, it was the character was by himself. And so I just created dialogue in the character's head going back and forth just to get that white space on the page and just to keep the character engaged between seeing characters speak, even though these are made, making up, these are just voices in my character's head, right? But I wanted to get away from that long chunk of prose where he's inner thinking and all that kind of stuff. I can do it, get away with it probably because I'm writing for Y and middle grade. And, and that age group is willing to experiment. You know, they're more open minded about what they'll accept, right? You do this with adults and they give you one star reviews because once you get to adulthood, you're so locked into how you're going to do things. And if everybody else doesn't match your understanding, you go, that ah, one star, you know, that kind of thing. Right, so I, just like the book I returned to the library. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not that it's a bad book; it just wasn't your book, right? That's yeah, right, exactly, to. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now so let's you talk about. Oh, go ahead. I was yeah, just. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, let's talk about a little bit about tag placement and what your thoughts are on where where the tags go for tag placement. I my preference. My favorite ones, although I know you have to bury them in any novel, but I like when the tagline can be tucked in the middle to change it up. I I like that. I like to see the tag put in the middle. And you gave an example uh, in our notes here. Let me see if I could. 
Oh, you here. Can I read this example? Yeah, Eddie? yeah. Okay, so here we go. Fine, I'll drive, Pam said, sliding behind the wheel. You hold the snake. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. see, I liked how you put, and I like too that you used her name. You can't use it all the time, right. but I like when you, you know, instead of the he, she, where you can say, Pam slid behind the wheel, you hold the snake. Yeah, and normally normally I would do that at the beginning of the, the conversation to let them know, everybody know, this is Pam speaking, because you, you may have another female come on the scene, and that's, she's a pronoun, but Pam, start with Pam, then revert to she, but you're right, using, using the person's real name, first name, again, reintroduces them into the scene in a concrete way. It's it's still the same character. You still tag to the same character, but it's variety, you know, and that just that little bit of variety helps to keep it redundant from he, he said and she said and all that. And I'm like you, I try when I can to tuck the tags in the middle of a, in the middle of two sentences from a conversation standpoint. Right. So complete sentence, she said, or he said, and then finish it out. Um, but it, it depends on the weight of the, yeah. of the comment. You know, it depends on, because you don't want to break up the weight of the comment. That's that's priority number one. Um, yeah, when I was working with Kim uh, Childress at Sonder Kids, uh, she was kind of adamant about don't not putting tags at the beginning of the sentence. Um, uh, she never really explained it. I think it's probably because it makes the sentence look heavy. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, it's like a branch, and then you hung an ornament off the end. So it's almost like making that branch drop before you even get to the rest of the sentence, right? So she would always go and ask me to move it to the end. Um, and for the most part, I agree with that. Uh, but occasionally, it, it helps to introduce the character at the beginning of the conversation. So if you're, in other words, if there's going to be a long, long sentence, you know, if it's going to be, if the character has a lot to say before you get to the punctuation, and then at the end of the punctuation, now I figure out who the speaker is, that can be a little bit of an issue. So sometimes it's right. okay to break it, for me break it, just move to the front. Ron Benray said, Eddie, I can't believe we're talking about dialogues again. When we just went over this last week in class and you're still talking about it now and you've got the handout but you haven't used it yet, period, right? So it would be something like that. Put Ron Benray said, comma, quotation marks. That's one way to do it. That's good. That's good. And you mentioned punctuation, well, um, not punctuation, but um, no, avoid ab adverbs and exclamation points. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the uh, Al Gansky, uh, the Al Gansky rule. Uh, Al Gansky said one exclamation point per manuscript, per book, per story is acceptable. You put two exclamation points in there. They're like cockroaches. They reproduce, and the next thing you know, you've got exclamation points all through your manuscript. And it's true. It is. I mean, it I, is. I went even then. I, you heard me. I went up on the inflection. I gave an exclamation point in that when I said it's true. Right. <laughs> That's what an exclamation point is. It is the narrator or the writer shouting to the reader, hey, this is important, pay attention to this. You can do that once. If you do it over, over and over, you, you're just a televangelist banging on the pulpit, you know, <laughs> screaming the whole time, saying, you got to do, you got to be saved, you got to be saved, you know. Uh, and that's wearing, that's just tiring. So, it um, is, it is. And no reader wants to be yelled at all the time. Right. We, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, we have, and and it, we see this in nonfiction. People will uh, use all caps or three exclamation points at the end of a sentence. And so one of the first things I do is make note of those couple places at the beginning. And then I tell them, no exclamation points, no caps. <laughs> Don't yell at your reader. But right. let's let me throw in here right, hang, hang uh, dialogue. Let me comment on that real quick. Let me comment on that real quick. Because oh, there's, also, there's an exception to that. So the, okay. the exception to the caps and the exclamation point, the, the exception is the Dave Barry exception. 
which is <laughs> if you're going to use caps and exclamation, you are doing it intentionally as for humor, as a joke. You are accentuating something that's bad in such a way that it becomes humorous, right? So that's why then you may start off with uh, stop the car, you know, period. And then the next thing, stop the car, exclamation point. And then the last one is all caps, three exclamation, stop the car, right? And that's just, that's humor built into it. That's the only, right. well, that, for the most part, that's the only time you get away with that. Well, and that's kind of the voice of the writer as well. All right, yeah. 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 Anyway, you were going to say. I was just going to throw in, um, just talk about dialogue in nonfiction writing. Um, okay. Generally, when I receive a nonfiction manuscript to edit, um, for the beginning writer, the debut, you know, they're hoping to publish this book, it would be their debut publication. I see them want to... Um, used as an example, a whole conversation they had with somebody else to that would illustrate the point of their chapter. Um, say it's a relationship chapter and they present a whole conversation of this is how not to do it. And they have this conversation. Most cases, the dialogue needs to be stripped and you need to use it in those cases I call it lazy writing because you're not thinking of your reader first of all readers don't want minute details of uh your examples because it makes them harder to put it on to their own life situation right. so it's most often I ask them to strip the dialogue I give them the example of just the point that they want to make develop the point just say in most conversations i have with others that are struggling with this issue i find it is best to approach the other person in this manner and then you know you're you're, te you're teaching them a skill set but you're not showing a whole conversation no that's good that's good. And, and now with chat GPT and the AI tools built in, it's just easy to grab that whole conversation, drop in and go, find me the three main points of this conversation. Right. There you go. And it'll yeah. find the three main points. And then you can turn around and write that in and say, this, the main point is what I'm trying to get at. Da, 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 boom. You know, and they get right. the same information really quick in bullets. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and I, I read a, boatload of both fiction and nonfiction, but when I read um, what, when it's done expertly, it's usually quoting somebody. It's a, when I see dialogue in nonfiction, it's generally you're, you're quoting, you're saying I was uh, at a lecture and heard Dr. So-and-so express this so well I'm just going to tell you exactly how he said it. And then you put the quote there or something yeah. similar in that vein. But generally, um, it's uh, don't don't be lazy. Work it out and, and mine for the gold that you really want to uh, teach your reader. Yeah. yeah. How about punctuation? Do we want to talk? Do we want to go down that controversial road of punctuation and dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> um sure if you want to do it <laughs> no, the other day the other day benny was reading my wife benny was reading something she said when did they move the question mark into the quote mark and you know that she, i mean she says uh, a question mark ends the sentence and i go i don't know, honey i don't know when they moved it in there it wasn't that way in the 70s when i was taking you know getting a journalism degree at state i said but somewhere along the way they moved it um, mm -hmm. and, and so now I get dinged. You know, I, I don't get dinged anymore. I've retrained myself. It's kind of like being a Mac user or a PC user. You can retrain yourself, you know. So I have retrained myself. I still think it's wrong. Um, I mean, I just still think punctuation mark ends the sentence, period. That's I agree. It. <laughs> yeah. If I you... have to keep it on an index card for me because I want to use the old school way of doing it. Yeah. 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 It, it... <laughs> 
<laughs> you add, add, he, he asked at the end of it, you well, know that the sentence is, is done, which brings us to another to another thing is, uh, I don't think I mentioned this in the notes, but um, in your dialogue, when you are adding the tags, you know, it's either going to be he said or she said, um, if somebody asks a question, uh, you can say, um, you know, he answered. That's one way. Like if you ask me a question, uh, Eddie, Eddie answered, well, I don't know, Diana. OK, that that's an appropriate way. And the word answered is OK, because now you're reminding the reader, hey, there was a question. Mm -hmm. Right. So especially for middle grade and why it's it's OK to do that, because you're reminding them that a question had just followed. Maybe they didn't catch it. Maybe the reader didn't realize it was a question, right? So now you're reminding them, hey, there was a question. Um, replied is a good is another good tag to use if you don't overuse it. Um, so that's that's a good one you can throw into add variety. Uh, replied, answered. Those are the two I think I was going to get to. Um, oh, and any ask. Well, you know, if you ask a question, instead of saying he said, make no shouldn't shouldn't say make sure, but it's expected that he's going to be he asked he asked uh, that you're going to tag it. that was it was a question so he asked or she asked uh, that, that kind of thing and these are like i said we know these things but we may not always just drop them in right hey i apologize for my <clears throat> with it's pollen season in the south <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and man my um sinuses my whole head is uh dealing with that but um, well, Eddie, I like that you, you know, I think in my adult uh, reading, as far as, uh, I hate to use word, word adult, because, you know, uh, that's a genre, I guess. Um, so in the middle reader YA, I can see you, somebody asking a question and then saying he answered, but in a novel, I think if you start a new paragraph after the question, then you don't really need the tag because the question was asked and then the person right. they were speaking to can respond. So that's another way is to begin a new paragraph, right? That's a tool. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're going to use, it's going to be a new paragraph anyway. It just depends on like we're talking about the age of the reader that you're talking about. Right. The older right. the reader, I mean, the more mature the reader and the genre. I mean, if you're writing literature, a lot of this isn't even going to apply because they expect you to be high brow smart anyway, right? Yeah. Um, if, you're, yeah. if you're writing, you know, low brow commercial fiction, uh, it was funny. We had somebody came in and, you know, was talking to us about carpet, redoing some of the carpet in the house and you know, the guy said, this is a, this is a middle grade right here. And I was like, Hey, that's what, that's for me. That's what I write. I read at a middle grade level. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. <laughs> anyway, so it just depends on your job and your target reader. So, yeah. Well, um, and one thing you mentioned, Eddie, in our list was the use of ellipses. Yeah. Um, I like them when appropriate. Yeah, I, I overuse them. Um, I, I do. And so I've, I've been deemed and been told I need to come back and, you know, pull back on the ellipses. Uh, and that's true. Uh, in some instances, I, I overuse them because I don't know what the answer is or how I want to finish the scene. So I'll just use an ellipses to get me out of that writing, <laughs> that box, and then just move on, you know, figuring I'll come back to it later. Um, but yeah, ellipses at the end of a end of a sentence leaves the, the thought or the conversation hanging. Um, you know, so what are we? You know, that's that's a conversation between a, a guy and a girl. Possibly, she doesn't finish the question and leaves it hanging, and that leaves it for him to pick up with that or not, right? And if he right. doesn't pick up, if he doesn't pick up with that, well, so what are we going to do? You know, she fought, she she finishes it you know, after that, that kind of thing. So that's what ellipses are good for. And the M dash and the M dash is good for the middle of a sentence where you're um, trying to trying to rephrase or restate what's important here, you know, uh, M dash, as if he could possibly forget what she was about to ask, M dash, going to do, you know, that kind of thing. 
uh, instead of putting it in parentheses, sometimes you'll use an M dash, uh, those kind of things. But if it's an M well, dash- I like, them, I like them in nonfiction too, because yeah. they they make a point. Um, right, right. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, I, I'm trying to retrain myself. I used to use M dashes at the end uh, as, a, as an abrupt break, or sometimes I would go and, you know, put, put it in there, but I've tried to train myself to just put them using dashes only to break up the middle of a sentence and use colons or semicolons at the end for that same same feature. But that's just, that's not really dialogue, it's just, uh, just right. writing. Right. <clears throat> so any other questions we've got? I, I've got a few. I want to kind of go switch gears and go with some inspirational thoughts before we close, but I wanted to make sure okay. we wrap dialogue tag. Do we have any final comments on dialogue tag we wanted to cover? Just find your balance and a good way to check if you're overusing or underusing and it's one of the best self-editing uh, tools is to read it out loud or put it into the uh, word has the little tool where it'll read it to you and that's such a good way to, to see if you're overusing or if you need one or if you could get away without one. It's just such a great, simple self-editing tool. Yeah, and I, I, normally we, we come up with two comments and I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with yours again. I'm gonna back you up on this one because the, okay. little, key, <laughs> the little keystroke, uh, I, I can't even tell you what that key is. It's to the left of D on my keyboard, but on my Mac, okay. It's it's a uh, option, and then that key. When I highlight it and use that, that's when it reads aloud to me. I have worn that, that key out, worn it out. Re-listening, well, not just to dialogue, but to prose as well, but definitely to dialogue because you can tell in dialogue when you listen to it, the ear hears it differently, and it's either going to create a vision in your head of two characters speaking, or it's going to sound clunky. Right. It can be perfectly right. The writing can be dead on. There's nothing wrong with the writing, but your ear is going to hear it in a way it goes, I'd really rather have this word here, right? And that's the beauty of re-listening to your dialogue yes. over and over. Yes. I think it was, it might have been, um, I don't think it was Zeno. It was somebody, um, I don't know. We Back early on in Blue Ridge, there were, there were authors who used to uh, act out their scenes. They would literally stand in front of their their keyboard, their you know laptop, and they would play the parts back and forth. Maybe Zena did do this, but anyway, and that got that got them into the mode, and they would go. Then they would know whether the scene worked or not, right? Because it was trying to get them into the vision. Of, yeah, of what they were that's fun. Doing. Get you up too, because we sit too long when we're writing at exactly. our computers. I just wanted to say, you in Word, it's under the review tab. Hit the review tab. And then on the left, you'll see read aloud speech. And yeah. that's where you click on that. And it will start wherever your cursor is placed. And then and it, it will read it to you. And I used to, I sometimes I'll put a whole manuscript when I'm done editing. I'll put it on and I'll cook and do other things. And I'll just listen while I'm doing something else. But I'm not, my laptop's close by because there are times I'll run, I'll drop the spoon yep. and I'll yep. run to the laptop, stop it, and then listen again and then make a correction. So yeah. um, it's it's just one of the best tools. So it, yeah. It will absolutely slow down the delivery of your manuscript because you're going to do this and go back and make tweaks. You just will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So here's, here's some, uh, th these are some inspiring I don't know, encouraging comments that I just want our writers to, to hear and these are these are this is what Jesus has said to us okay. as writers okay Jesus said everything is possible for, for he or she who believes everything is possible everything is possible to the one who believes that's in mark 9 23. Whatever you release, so if we're releasing a book, mm -hmm. an album, a painting, a speech, whatever you release on earth has been released in heaven already. Now, if it's, if it's been released in heaven, then it's already blessed. It's already yeah. blessed, right? 
And that's Matthew 18, 18. And then we'll close with this one. If at least two of you agree on earth about anything you ask for, it will be done by my Father for you in heaven. So all you've got to do is find one other person that agrees that your story, your book, your manuscript is, is worthy. One other person. And ask. And our Father in heaven is like, yeah, I, I can go with that. I can go with that. Right? Now, when they mean agree, it's got to be within God's character. So it's right. going to glorify him. It's going to bless you. It's going to bless other people. There's nothing that's, you know, going to deter from that. But it doesn't have to be, it's not like you're building a new kingdom or anything. You're just moving in his in his grace. And, and if you're doing that, he's going to bless it. So anyway, I, I throw that out there because I know sometimes we get kind of discouraged that I don't see the fruit yet. And I'm just saying, yeah, he's already blessed it. <laughs> he's, he's, he, you know, there, I, and I'll close with this. I am convinced that we absolutely, for the most part, have no idea how hard he's, he's, he, Jesus is interceding for us right now. We can't even conceive of how hard he's interceding for us. He is trying to get us as excited about what we're doing, our writing, as he is, right? And, and I just want us to kind of close with that because I, I forget this too often and we need to hear this more often. So there you that's go. That's great. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Thank you, Eddie. Appreciate All it. All right. Well, I've got an idea for a guest coming up and I've got reach out to her so I'll, I'll pin you after this and let you know okay but, uh, thanks and i hope I, I keep sending those pictures of the beach uh, <laughs> it, it helps me. I'm, I'm not back out on it yet but i see my doctor monday i expect him to release me to, out there so i'm right at the edge but i i just haven't ventured out yet but i think i'll be released um and able to get out there soon so good, good. thanks diana see you next week all right have a good week everybody